Hello, I thank you for watching this important video. I have a lot of things to show you, as well as an important message. I am going to plainly explain to you how ordinary iron, the most abundant element on earth, the cheapest metal at about 20 cents a pound, and one of the most abundant elements in the entire universe, is in fact an inexhaustible source of clean energy using already well understood properties of electromagnetism. I am not really saying anything new at all. I'm just putting the pieces together for you and showing you how they fit together. Initially, skepticism is understandable as there are a lot of questionable and difficult to understand inventions relating to energy. This is not any sort of miracle claim of free energy in any way. It is merely a, another form of alternate energy production that will have its pros and cons just like all other forms of energy. However, as, soon, as you will soon clearly understand after watching this video, everything I propose is just plain, simple, established, elementary science, and it all can be very easily proven and demonstrated. I know that convincing people will be a challenge, and so I will show you over a dozen simple experiments to prove my point. One of the things that will confuse people is Newton's laws, which are often summarized to state that energy can never be created nor destroyed. This axiom was developed many hundreds of years ago to explain closed loop thermodynamic systems and gravitational systems such as pulleys. In those systems, the axiom works perfect and it makes perfect sense. But he created those theories before electromagnetism was understood and it is now proven that they do not always apply to quantum physics. Magnetism and electromagnetism are quantum physics. The fact is that Newton just did not imagine quite how much energy is contained in matter like Einstein did. Einstein gave us the equation E equals mc squared. That means that there is an unimaginable amount of energy in each and every gram of matter. This little gold magnet here weighs one gram. If just one gram of matter were instantly converted into the pure energy contained within it, it would be equal to many thousands of atomic bombs. What I'm going to show you is just one way that we can tap into this vast reservoir of energy. I will show you a lot of experiments to make my case here. Let us start by examining how light, heat and cold, and wind can make energy by using simple experiments. This is called a radiometer. It has four veins encased in glass that are white on one side and black on the other. This represents the potential of solar energy. The black side of the veins absorb the light energy while the light is reflected off of the white side of the veins. This will cause the veins to physically move when light is shown upon it. It is encased in glass because it is such a weak force that it would be disrupted by even the slightest breeze. Light energy has the weakest energy density and potential of all energy sources. It is only commonly used because half the earth is bathed in sunlight at any given time. This is a pinwheel and it represents wind energy. When placed in a wind, such as this fan here is providing, you can see that it is it causes the pinwheel to turn. It is definitely turning more robustly than the radiometer, but note that I can still stop it with my finger. Wind energy has a stronger potential than light energy, but the speed and direction of wind is unpredictable and highly variable in most places. Now this is a Stirling engine invented by Robert Stirling in 1816. This is also called an external combustion engine, and it operates by heat differential similar to earlier steam engines. Even modern industrial megawatt steam engines work using the same basic principle. I have here a cup of boiling water. If we place a Stirling engine on it, 
soon it will begin to move. It is basically converting the heat energy to physical motion. The energy potential of boiling water is significant, and that is why it is used for the majority of energy production to this day. However, no, I can still easily stop it with my finger, just as easily as the pen will. Let me remove the Stirling engine. Now, let us look at battery power and electricity generation. This is a small and basic electrical motor in its most simple form. It consists of a battery, a magnet, and this coil of copper wire. And this will demonstrate the energy potential that is contained in a battery. See, it's uh, turning the copper wire, but I can still easily stop it with my finger. Now, here is another commercially made small electric motor. If I connect it to the batteries, you will see it turn. Now, it's definitely turning much more strongly than the other generator. Now that I can still easily stop it with my finger. Now if we connect nothing but dead rechargeable batteries to this motor and then turned it repeatedly, it will eventually replace the rechargeable batteries. So these simple electric motors can also operate as electrical generators. And the simple motor also demonstrates how physical motion, such as provided by the solar, wind, and thermal energy, is converted to electrical power. In fact, most of the energy we use today is used by boiling water, created by burning natural gas or coal, and using that steam to turn a steam turbine that turns a generator. So most of modern energy production basically combines the concept of the Stirling engine and the generator. However, the copper coils of a generator do not capture the full force of the magnetic field and only captures a small part of it. The generator is only one part of the story of how we can use magnetism to not only generate electricity from an input force, but also to amplify power and create those input forces. Let me show you how powerful even a very small magnet can be. This thin, one inch diameter, one sixteenth of an inch magnet can easily lift this five pound weight. It could hold this weight for decades. Now I can easily stop the radiometer, the pinwheel, the Stirling engine, and the electrical motor with my finger. This thin magnet is clearly demonstrating a force much greater than the other experiments. The rest of this video will explain this discrepancy and will explain how we can finally take full advantage of the properties of electromagnetism. Before I get started on how we can capture all the energy we need with iron and electromagnetism, I would like to show you a demonstration of how we can amplify an input force using only permanent magnets. This experiment is important because it proves that we can capture the energy from magnetism in a way similar to capturing wind energy with a windmill. Certain types and combinations of ferromagnetic materials can retain a magnetic charge, and these are called permanent magnets. Permanent magnets have their own interesting set of properties. Some of the properties of permanent magnets can also be used to directly amplify an input force. First, let me show you how when two magnets have the same side poles facing each other, they repulse each other with the exact same force that would occur if the opposite sides were attracting each other. So it completely counterbalances the attracting force. The other property of magnets that you need to know is the shear force. 
How do you separate a strong magnet? Well, you always shear it apart perpendicular to their poles. You do not pull them apart, you shear them apart. It's a simple demonstrable fact that the shear force is always less than the pull force. Now generally the pull force is greater than the shear force by a factor greater than three times. Why are these properties important and how can we take advantage of it? Well, here is a permanent magnet piston that I invented. You can see that the position of the anchor magnet in the middle is fixed and the piston magnet is attached to the counterweight magnet. Now, the counterweight magnet is repulsed from the anchor magnet. The piston magnet is attracted to a fourth magnet that I call the trigger magnet. When the trigger magnet is underneath the piston magnet, the counterweight magnet is pulled towards the anchor magnet, thereby storing nearly the full pull force between the piston and trigger magnets. The trigger magnet can then be moved perpendicular to the piston, releasing over three times more energy than is used to move the trigger magnet. You can see the input and output power curves in this graph on my shirt. Now let me show you. There is absolutely no way that you can hold back the power release with each pull with your finger. With each pull, this is releasing a force far, far greater than any of the other experiments we have seen so far. It's not hard at all to imagine a lot of uses for this phenomenon. In fact, there are a number of possible ways to amplify the input force much greater than three times. This alone could be used to produce a lot of extra usable clean power. However, there is also a different and simple way to amplify power using nothing but copper and iron. And this is what the remainder of this video will explain. Before I go into explaining how to amplify and capture power using only copper and iron, I would like to give you an analogy that will help explain why it does not contradict any known physical science in any way. See, whenever there's a two-way differential, such as hot or cold, or high pressure and low pressure, there's a potential energy there that can be captured. If there were two rooms, one hot and one cold, we could capture usable energy until the rooms were at the same temperature. An air conditioner requires energy because we are increasing the differential and not decreasing this differential. In magnets, there is a binary magnetic field. The binary magnetic field is a two-way differential. This is created by the electron spinning around perpetually around the nucleus of the atom. This is why the differential will never be equalized, just as long as the domains in the magnet are aligned. Capturing this energy from magnets is like a water wheel capturing the energy from a spring, or a windmill capturing the energy from a blowing wind. This analogy explains why it does not violate any laws of physics to capture the energy from magnets. The magnetic force flows around the magnet. Regardless of whether or not we capture the energy, we are simply capturing the inherent flow of this energy. To understand magnetism, we must first think of what it is on the atomic level. Magnetism is believed to be caused by synchronized electrons that perpetually spin around atomic nuclei at the speed of light, warping the fabric of space-time. This leaves something akin to the wake of a boat in water that manifests itself as the magnetic field. There are several various states and instances where magnetism can form or interact with atoms on a subatomic level, but we will focus on just a couple of these. Specifically, we will focus on magnetism's effect on iron and copper. This is iron and this is copper. Most types of matter and states of matter seem to be only slightly or completely non affected by magnetism. And these are not of interest here, such as the magnet is completely un unattracted and has very little effect on wood. Electricity and magnetism are intrinsically related. The two are often referred to as electromagnetism. 
One common form of electricity is the movement of electrons from atom to atom in a conductor. Some elements are considered to be conductive. Although there are many other conductors, we will focus on just the most common conductor used, copper. In a conductor like copper that has electrons flowing through it, the flow of the electrons causes them to synchronize, thereby creating a magnetic field. Copper is an element with one electron in its outer shell that is able to move between different atoms when exposed to either a voltage source or a changing magnetic field. When a straight copper wire is exposed to a voltage source, the outer shell electrons will align their orbits as they move along the wire. This produces an outwardly radiating magnetic field. When a live copper wire is coiled around in a circle like this, the magnetic field will become a binary magnetic field and will have two poles just like in a permanent magnet. In a permanent magnet, the electrons are synchronized without a current moving from atom to atom. Conversely, magnetism is commonly used to generate electricity by subjecting coils of copper wires to a fluctuating binary magnetic field. So electricity can cause magnetism and magnetism can cause electricity. This is a flashlight with a magnet and a coil of copper wire and when the magnet is moved you can see it produces electricity. The magnetic field pushes and pulls the electrons in the outer shell of the copper thereby moving them. And so this is the relationship between electricity and magnetism, or electromagnetism. However, this is not the full story. This is because magnetism will interact with copper and iron very differently. We have to imagine how magnetism interacts with both copper and iron separately, and then compare and contrast the relationships, and then we can learn how to use them together. Only then will we understand how we can use these separate set of properties to both amplify power and also to capture the full energy from magnetism. Some elements are considered ferromagnetic, such as iron. From here on, we will simply use the word iron, although other ferromagnetic materials can be used as well. Also, low carbon steel, like this, is also a suitable equivalent of iron as it contains mostly iron and is magnetic. Iron and similar elements have two electrons in their outer shell and this particular feature is the reason for their unique properties. When exposed to an external magnetic field, the outer electrons in an iron material will automatically synchronize and align themselves and it will create their own binary magnetic field. This results in iron being able to vastly amplify a magnetic field, whereas copper cannot. This fact has been known for hundreds of years and was observed by René Picard in the early 1600s. The natural amplification of energy is nothing new. The property of resonance has been used to amplify sound energy for millennia. <laughs> Magnetic amplification can occur when iron is combined with a permanent magnet or placed inside a copper coil that has the current applied to it. Let me show you how iron will amplify a permanent magnet. What we're going to do is take this very thin magnet, one inch in diameter, one sixteenth of an inch thick, and a non-magnetic steel washer one inch in diameter and one sixteenth of an inch thick. I'm going to show you how the iron washer will amplify the magnetic field of this magnet. If we take this thin magnet, it will hold 13 sheets of this thick paper. Now watch what happens when I try to add one more sheet. It will no longer hold the paper the weight. 
just falls right off. However, if I piggyback this iron washer on it, it will go from holding 13 sheets of paper to 19 sheets of paper, six more sheets. That's an amplification of about 45%. only by using this extra little piece of iron. Now, a copper coil that has a current applied to it will have a relatively weak magnetic field, as copper has only one electron creating the field, and it simply does not create a very strong field. Simply placing iron inside the coil will vastly amplify the magnetic force. Let me demonstrate. This is a electromagnet that I made and it does not have any iron core. This is another electromagnet that I made. And the only difference between these two electromagnets, they both have the same amount of copper and number of coils, is that this electromagnet has this amount of iron inside of it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pour some of these little iron staples onto the table and I'm going to show you the difference and what's going to happen when we connect the batteries to the electromagnet without any iron inside of it we'll be lucky if we can pick up even just one of these little staples picked up one little staple However, when we connect an identical electromagnet to the batteries that has the iron core in it, it will pick up well over a hundred of these staples. Many ferromagnetic materials such as iron will not retain their magnetism when they are no longer in a magnetic field. This is useful for use in electromagnets that can be turned on and off repeatedly. The ability to amplify the magnetism of a copper coil with an iron core, as well as the ability to turn the resulting electromagnet on and off, are both key facts that you must know, which will allow you to understand and look at magnetism in a new way and as a source of energy. It is important to fully understand the difference between the way that magnetism interacts with copper and the way that it interacts with iron in order to understand how we can capture usable energy from magnetism alone. A magnet does not stick to copper. However, a magnet dropped for, through a copper tube will fall much slower than if dropped outside of the tube. This is because the magnetism relatively weakly interacts with the electrons in copper in a fundamentally different way than it interacts with iron. Even though copper relatively weakly interacts with the magnetic flux when compared with iron, there is a resistance and in a generator this resistance is converted into usable power in the form of electricity. Whenever I turn this little small electric motor, which can also be used as a generator, you see it turns a few times and then stops. That is the resistance of the magnets to the copper. The resistance can be overcome in many ways. And in current energy production, it is usually provided by hydroelectric power or steam turbines powered by burning gas, coal, or nuclear fission. Another great benefit of copper is that the energy can be transmitted long distances over copper power lines. In contrast, a magnet will not only stick to iron, but it will also be strongly attracted to it from a distance. A magnet's resistance when dropped through an iron tube would be vastly greater than the resistance dropped through a copper tube, and it would have to actually be greatly weighted down to fall at all. As already stated, a useful property of iron over copper is that it will actually naturally greatly amplify a much weaker magnetic field. 
such as in the coil of the electromagnet. Another key property of iron over copper is that it can interact with magnetism at a distance and can be used to capture the total force of the magnetic field of a magnet or an electromagnet. The steam engine was first developed in the late 1600s and early 1700s. They were not all that different from the Stirling engine. Today, gas, coal, and nuclear fission use heat to create steam that turns turbines and provide us with the vast majority of the energy that we use, basically using the same technology hundreds of years ago. Even the earliest steam engines used the binary differential of hot and cold to create energy. Of course, now the engines are usually turbines that are connected to generators. The modern generator was developed in the middle of the 1800s. So the scientific basis for the vast majority of the power that we use today is fundamentally identical to technology developed over 160 years ago. The fundamental basis of the generator is fairly simple. A conductive coil of copper wire is exposed to a changing magnetic field and this creates electrical current in the copper that can be transported and used in many different ways. The electricity generated is directly proportional to the resistance of the coils to the magnetic field. The magnetic field that generates all of the current in many generators actually comes from an electromagnet that uses only a very small portion of the total energy generated. This is called self-induction. This magnetic field is amplified with iron as would be expected. The amplification with iron is why only a small portion of the total electricity generated is needed to create the magnetic flux necessary to power a self-induction generator. However, in such a generator, the benefit of iron amplification cannot be captured or utilized. If you increase the strength of the magnetic field further and the number of coils, you will also increase the resistance between the magnetic field and the copper. This means it will need more energy to turn the generator, and in a generator, the relationship between the energy put in and the electricity put out is directly correlated. In order to capture the amplified energy from electromagnets, a different mechanism is needed that will capture the full force from the electromagnets amplified magnetic field and convert it into physical energy. The mechanism for capturing the full force of electromagnets amplified magnetic field and converting it into physical energy with little resistance only involves more iron and is actually extremely straightforward, familiar, and simple in every possible way. What I'm about to tell you next really should have been invented and fully established at least 120 years ago. The mechanism required to fully capture the force of a magnet is very similar to the ubiquitous, familiar, and ordinary internal combustion engine. The only real difference is that electromagnets amplified by an iron core will be used in place of fuel, and the pistons will be pulled downwards towards the electromagnets instead of being pushed outward by the explosion of fuel. The pistons will use a flat iron strike plate instead of ordinary pistons. The iron and the electromagnet core will amplify the input energy and the flat iron strike plate will fully capture that amplified magnetic force and convert it into a physical motion. Due to the properties of electromagnetism, the pistons sh should be placed farther apart than in a normal combustion engine and the length of the stroke will need to be sharpened. This will make the crank shafted engine proportioned slightly different in a magnet piston engine when compared to the internal combustion engine. Also, the electromagnets should be deeper in comparison to ordinary commercial electromagnets. Instead of being this thick, it should be about, about two and a half times thicker to deepen the magnetic field of the electromagnets. Keep in mind that what we are doing is as follows. 
we can take a small electrical input and make an electromagnet by coiling conductive wire in a loop and running current through. The magnetic field of the electromagnet is then vastly amplified with the iron core. We can then fully capture the magnetic field of the electromagnet with an iron strike plate. This motion can be transferred mechanically via a crankshaft to a generator, which will then convert all of the amplified motion into electrical energy. The energy output will be greater than the energy input due to the amplification of the magnetic force by the iron core. A relatively small portion of this energy can be then rerouted back to the electromagnets to continue powering the engine. These engines can be used in any way that the internal combustion engine can be used. The fuel for the magnet piston engine is the elemental iron cores of the electromagnet. The iron cores provide an inexhaustible source of clean energy, and this is not contrary to any known laws of physics in any way. I can easily prove mathematically the electromagnet piston engine, but I'm going to do that in another video. I can think of many variations of the concepts that I've shown you that would be viable on both large and small scales and in many different situations. I can think of countless experiments that I would like to perform that would further our knowledge. Unless someone recognizes my work and helps me out, this is the end of the road for me. We are out of time.